Begin, uh, good morning. Parshat Behar, which you can find on page 696 uh, in your art scroll Chumash. Uh, we have a double portion again this week. Behar Bechotai. Tell me something. Yes. <laughs> That's early. Get head start. This is showing my ignorance in front of everybody. Well, I'm not proud. So, uh, why are there double portions? Okay. So remember, we have every every uh, every 19 years there are seven years that are leap years that you have an extra month. So you need extra parshiot. So therefore, they have to collapse on the non-leap years, which are most years. We have to go ahead and have to, we have to collapse them. Uh, we have reasons to go ahead and complete the book of Vaikra uh, for Shavuot. There are reasons for placing things at specific places. Nevertheless, Vaikra is the collapsed, collapsed Chumash. That like, uh, you know, we had like, out of four weeks, thank you very much. Oh wow, this is unbelievable. This is a little thank you. Wait, you didn't taste it yet. <laughs> I know, I know. No, that's good. That's good. So therefore, we have double parshiot, and this is the last one because we are finishing the book of. Uh, and how is the how is the decision made? Which to combine? Which ones to go at? So they have it's, They are in all cases they are linked. There's a relationship between them. If you look at this week's parsha, it talks. For, it's a perfect example. You have a portion that begins with the significance of the mitzvah of Shemitah. Warnings that if you do not go ahead and adhere to these mitzvahs, you are going to be exiled from your land. So therefore, the second portion deals with a prediction or a warning of the actual exile. So there's always going to be a relationship between the two parshiot, Tazriya and Mitzora. Uh, you have a portion that talks about uh, you know, being affected, afflicted by the Tzarat, and then a portion that shares with us how to go ahead and purge yourself, to purify yourself from the Sarah. So there's going to be a relationship between the two. Those are actually very good questions. Good, good. And what we're going to do is focus a little bit on Parashat Behar. So we're going to turn to the beginning of Parashat Behar. Let's, I think we're going to spend, if not the whole class, at least most of it there. But with one brief look at uh, the prohibition of uh, rebeats. Vaydaber Hashem el Moshe Behar Sinai Lemor. Hashem spoke to Moshe, guess where? On Mount Sinai. Le'emor, same. This term le'emor we've dealt with in the past. What exactly does that mean? It is more than same, but it is how to say it. Use the proper language. Use the language that will be understood. And this is a message not just for Moshe Rabbeinu. It is a message for all leaders, for all Torah teachers. You got to be familiar with the language, and we do not just mean language. We have to. What it means is understand the culture, understand the people, understand the generation. You know, there are stories of the Dubna Magid, who was able to give great metaphors uh, to to get across his message. And the metaphors usually refer to horses and carriages and shtetlach, which were so relevant in the 18th century. A little bit less in the 20th century. Chavitz Chaim actually was able to upgrade and he gave his Misholem about to use the concept of a telephone, he even mentioned an airplane. He had, an under, he had the ability to go ahead and get his point across using the language of that generation. Rabbinic leaders have to have that ability to use the word, the term le'emor. Uh, there was a, a rabbi that uh, I had a relationship in who lived in Israel, Rabbi Pinkas Atzal. And he talked about, you know, when he talked about prayer and the significance of understanding what you are saying, so he mentions that uh, praying uh, and not fully appreciating what is being said is, is your, it's like driving, but on the lowest gear when you could drive at a much higher gear. So that's a good marshal for those who know how to drive a stick shift. For me, it had absolutely no meaning because <laughs> I only drive an automatic. So, uh, so that's... You have to understand the language, you have to understand the period. So that is le'emor, know how to communicate. 
And the Lehemor here in this week's parsha is indeed a very significant one. Now, the obvious question which we have dealt with in the past and we're going to revisit today with a little bit of a different angle is we know very well that the Torah was given to us at Har Sinai. It's so much part of our identity. You could go ahead and make that declaration. You could go ahead and open any portion in the Torah with those words. God spoke to Moshe at Mount Sinai saying because everything was taught at Mount Sinai. So what's unique here? Why does the Torah specifically spell out right here that you should know that this information was given at Mount Sinai? So, Rashi shares with us a very early rabbinic statement clarified by Rabbi Akiva, and it works as follows. And you have to remember these three locations. The Torah was taught. The Torah was communicated to Moshe. And he turned around and communicated to the people of Israel three times. There were three revelations in essence. So he was a teacher based on receiving information three times. Once, the first time was at Har Sinai. Okay, he spent there uh, longer than expected uh, time. Uh, he had to clean up a mess. But in any event, he was there at Har Sinai. He was taught from... Uh, the mouth of the Rabbonu Shalom, he communicated with Klal Yisrael afterwards. Har Sinai was the first time that he received Torah information. Number two, number two is known as the Ohel Moed, throughout the years in the wilderness. Moshe Rabbeinu stood outside the tabernacle and he was able to hear the voice of the Almighty coming to him, being transmitted by the Holy Ark, the voice came from on top of the Holy Ark, it communicated with him according to tradition, and he received the teachings of the Torah. So, revelation number two we could call, or experience, or receiving of Torah number two is at Ohel Moed. The word Ohel Moed means the Ark that's of designated time, the, oil, the, the Mishkan as we call it, that was revelation number two, Torah experience number two. The third one takes place the last month or so before his passing at Arvot Moab on the west bank of the Jordan River. The nation of Israel is semi-settled there. They are in some ways settled. settled. They already interact with society. Right? We find them in the marketplace. Unfortunately, they stumble there, but they are in the marketplace. Uh, we find them, a few tribes already, planning or settling their families, the tribes of Reuven Gad and the half of Menashe. They are there on the west side of the Jordan River. It is no longer the wilderness. In essence, they are on the east side, excuse me, west bank, east side. Good, good. Never got to the West Bank. Never got to the West Bank. It would have been an occupation. So he went to, the, according to the BBC. So let's review that again. On the east side of the Jordan. Jordan. Modern day Jordan. The nation of Israel is settled there. To some extent, some tribes are settled. But they interact with society. Only in the days of Yehoshua... 33 days after the passing of Moshe Rabbeinu, do they indeed cross. And if you remember, on our tour we took to Israel, we went uh, to the allegedly location of the crossing, maybe yes, maybe no, but not too far from there without doubt, and then they enter into Eretz Yisrael. So, settled there at Arvot Moab, no longer in the wilderness, they received teachings from Moshe Rabbeinu, and things were repeated, taught to him in detail, and he repeats it and he teaches it to Klal Yisrael. So what was the third Torah experience, the third teaching? It was called Be'arvot Moab. Now, with that, there are times in the Torah where you will only find the details of a mitzvah describe as the nation is traveling in the wilderness. Meaning, the Torah describes the situation that they are traveling in the wilderness, uh, in the Parshat Bamidbar. A portion is shared with them, a portion like the wine libations, whatever it is. 
One would have thought that perhaps Moshe only received that information at Ohel Moed. Perhaps that information is not from Sinai. One might have thought so. Therefore, the Torah tells us here the following. You should know, the mitzvah of Shemitah is given to us, is mentioned already in Parshat Mishpatim, earlier on when we know for a fact that Moshe was right there at Har Sinai. The details are given to us here. So what the rabbis are, or what the Torah is telling us with these words, that the laws of Shemitah, by the Ber Hashem, El Moshe, Behar Sinai, is to tell you that you should know all the details were already given at Sinai. All details were already taught at Sinai. This is the view of Rabbi Akiva. They were taught at Sinai, reviewed again at Ohel Moed, throughout the years in the wilderness, and then again, they were taught to the nation of Israel, the Arvot Moab, on the east bank of the Jordan River. So that's what we are told here. Now, why specifically Shemitah became the law to teach us this concept? So this is something that we must go ahead and clarify. Now, we are familiar with the laws of Shemitah. Sheshanim Tizra Sadecha, you work for six years, you completely rest on year seven, and then you go ahead and you have a seven year cy seven cycles of seven years, which enters into the Jubilee. We much, once mentioned the fact that there's a debate after the Jubilee. Jubilee is year 50. The year after Jubilee, the year after the Yovel, is that year one of a cycle, or perhaps it's year two, because Shemitah was two years ago. So there's a dispute in the Talmud between two rabbis. We no longer have the Yovel. Yovel is no longer in play after the tribes that were settled on the east side of the Jordan River were exiled. And by the way, Jordan, modern day Jordan, is, was at one time 100% Eretz Israel. Meaning, when Moshe Rabbeinu was there, it was not Eretz Israel because he couldn't come into Eretz Israel. But after they crossed the Jordan, conquered Israel, and the tribes, after a 14-year period, returned to the east side of the Jordan River, it became bona fide Eretz Israel. And therefore, when they were exiled from it, we no longer had Jewish people throughout the land of Israel. So we view Jordan as Eretz Israel. Just important to remember, with negotiations, if they ever happen, it's much healthier if we can negotiate with an acceptance that Jordan is ours as well. And this is something that I didn't come up with. It's something that Jabotinsky, Jabotinsky thought of. And if you look on YouTube, you could go ahead and see a clip of him in Yiddish, sounds like the good Rosh Shiva, talking about El Tzisrael, and it has uh, Eivet Ayarden, he mentions, and he is view and the emblem of uh, the followers of Jabotinsky, at least in the earlier years, was a map of Israel, including Jordan, with a weapon, because they had a view, which uh, Weizmann didn't agree with, that you're going to have to fight uh, to gain your independence. Weizmann did not agree with that. He believed that if we just smile and ask nicely, uh, the British who just love us are going to give us a land. So... Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. Anyway. That, is the, the, that was the reality. Ever Hayarden was Eretz Yisrael, and even, even in the days of, uh, with, with Balfour, you know your history. We don't have to go ahead and review that, but we know the Torah here as well. Now, what I want to uh, at least uh, develop, hopefully, is an understanding of what is unique, unique about Shemitah, and what is this idea of Torah being repeated three times at Havmar Har Sinai, in the tabernacle, and then when they are settled there, to some extent, on the east bank of the Jordan River. Now, if we move forward in this week's portion to page 702, uh, the model in Sharia law, which we do not uh, have a share on Sharia law, there's a prohibition called riba. Riba, coming from the word ribit. Ribit. And there's a, I have a book I got from my older brother, a whole book on Islamic finance, and uh, they have some issues. There are many issues, but one of their issues has to do with uh, in the area of finance. We have that prohibition at, as well. There is a prohibition to charge interest. Okay? We have a system around it known as a heter isco. We are familiar with it. And God wants us to have that system because if it came up with by if the rabbis came up with it 
and they understood that the marketplace cannot function without it. So therefore, it is the will of God to use it, but not to misuse it. And the Torah actually makes reference to it, because we are told in verse 36 that there is a prohibition. Do not take from him, and we're talking about uh, from a fellow Jew, interest, you shall feel, you fear your God. And the Torah adds that we must remember and fear our Creator. And Rashi points out that the words fear God appear here not in every single mitzvah, and we can understand very well why. And it works as follows. If, let's say, a person wants to borrow funds uh, to open a business, and he needs those funds, there is no way for him to get on his own feet without it. He is more than happy to go ahead and pay you 4 or 5% interest. He benefits from it because he knows very well that he's going into an industry that his return will be far greater. So you go ahead and you lend him funds. You, want to, you don't want to lose out because you could be investing in the bank, whatever Shvachamas says they offer, but then nevertheless it's money. So you put together and you sign a Heter Iska. Technically it means that you are in essence partners with him, even though in, a, in reality you're not. That is using the Heter Iska in a, an appropriate way based on the values of Torah. Why? What are you doing? You are assisting him in business. You have the right to go ahead and try to earn some money as well, but you are using it the way it was intended. Now let's say another, another example would be there's a person in the neighborhood that is poor, that has going through difficult times, he has expenses, medical expenses, and he needs $10,000. So you go ahead and you hand him the $10,000, but you say, you know what? I would like to sign a heter iska. I want to get around the prohibition of the Torah with this loophole of this heter iska. That is misusing it. It is misusing the system. So in other words, there is an ideal that exists in the Torah, no charging interest. The Torah itself, through the rabbis, has an allowance because the marketplace cannot function with the law as is. But when the rabbis present that leniency, they don't present it for you to abuse and misuse the system. They want you to go ahead and assess in what cases is it the ethic, ethical thing to do, and in what cases not. So when you make a decision, should I go ahead and demand interest and sign a heteriska to get around the legal issue, or in what case is not, fear God. You have to go ahead and fear the Creator and think, what does God want in this case? What's the ethical thing to do? We all know very well that the legal system, you can always find loopholes, you can always get around it. But the legal system is there for us to learn. There are times that it's the greatest mitzvah to try to get around the system. There are times that it's the biggest mitzvah to find every leniency possible. There are times that you go ahead and you try to find every leniency possible, you are in essence destroying all what Judaism is about. Correct? So this is something that we learn from those few words. Viyareta me'elokecha. Fear your God. Before you go ahead and deal with this law, fear your God. So this is a, a, rule, a rule that relates to Rebit, but in essence it applies to all mitzvot. And it applies to Shemitah more than anything else, anything else. A very significant appearance as is. As you know, in the early days of the Hityashut, of the settlements of the land in the land of Israel, there were there are already very there are discussions among rabbinic scholars in the year 1882 regarding the Shemitah of 1882. There were, were small Yeshuvim, they were insignificant. And they actually mostly kept Shemitah because they were not, they did not have a stronghold yet on the marketplace, and them, ta them taking a year off was not an issue. By 1889, Baruch Hashem, it became problematic because people were already exporting, and there was a concern that if they're going to go ahead and follow the laws of Shemitah, they're going to go ahead and destroy their own businesses and the future of the Yishuv. So therefore, rabbis came up with what's known as the heter mechira, a leniency, a lupo, to get around the legal issue of having work done on your field in the land of Israel and Shemitah by selling land to the non-Jews. It's a system, again, it's a lupo. Was it necessary? Well, 
At times, using it and utilizing it is necessary. At times, not. Many rabbinic authorities believed in 1889 that it is necessary, like Rav Naftali Suyud of Berlin, uh, like Rabitz Gachon, the great Boskim. Others did not. And we know very well, if we fast forward to 1910, Rav Kook was the one that really allowed it, finalized it, and there was a controversy of rabbis who didn't agree with the system itself. But we have to ask ourselves, I, for example, I'm a farmer in the land of Israel. I know that if I take off this year, if I do not produce anything during this year, I will lose my market share. You cannot tell your suppliers throughout the world, you know what, this year you'll have to find someone else. If they find someone else for one year, you can forget of them ever returning. So if I go to a rabbi and say, I need a heter mechira, very, it's very possible that's the right thing, the greatest mitzvah, to go ahead and find a legal way of getting around the problem. What if I am a farmer, and the people buying from me are locals, and they know that if this year, because of Shemitah, I'm not going to supply them, and they can actually come and take their own fruit, uh, they'll be fine with it, because they're sensitive to it. This year, they'll figure out some other option, and they'll eat more pasta, and next year, they'll come back uh, for, the, for the oranges. For me, meaning the one that could deal with the law, it will be quite harmful, it will be wrong, ethically wrong, to try to get around it if I can manage without it. So how do you figure out, how do you figure out which one, what should I do? The Areta Melech Afir God. Now, imagine the following, and this is what I call the three stages of the studying of Torah. The three stages of studying and applying Torah in our life. Stage number one, you have uh, we're, we're going to travel again to the shtetl, okay? You have a young rabbinic student, a bright man, he's 13, wasn't so interested in, uh, in tradition. He visited the large city too many times. He happened to be in Paris for whatever reason. He came, he wasn't not too interested in tradition. Reappears back in the shtetl and for whatever reason gets inspired to keep the laws of Torah. So you could go ahead and decide on your own what event inspired him. You know, the, the great uh, Franz uh, Rosenzweig was inspired on Yom Kippur. So let's give it a Yom Kippur for him. Or Shavuos. We're coming to Shavuos. He sat at a meal, enjoyed the wonderful cheesecake. Uh, he, he was inspired by the words of Akadamos, even though no one really understands them, but he was inspired. So he decides, I am going to commit myself to the mitzvot of Torah, and I saw that in Paris, uh, you know, people were not eating kosher there. I'm gonna fulfill the mitzvah of eating kosher to the fullest. That's what his inspir the moment of inspiration was: commitment to kosher. For example, okay. So that's experience number one in his relationship: the commitment. It all begins with commitment. Next, he spends the next two years studying the laws of kosher in detail. It pulls out a yaradea. He learns the laws of Shechita, goes to the greatest Shochet in, in, in the whole region. In the, he shows them how to Shech. He learns the laws of Trefos, what makes an animal not kosher. In many of the cases, there are issues with the lungs. You have to do an inner check. You have to, the Shochet or the Boret has to roll up his sleeve and put his arm in the cavity of the animal. It's okay, I'm the only one that's drinking, you also drink. But he has to put his arm in the cavity of the animal to check the non-adhesions between the lung and the side. And it's something that sounds, you know, I, again, I get, I see a squirrel or a lengu that dies on the street, I can't deal with it well. <laughs> but lo and behold, when I was in Chile and I was learning the laws, I did it. Why? Because sometimes when it becomes halachic, it becomes exciting. In other words, here is something that I was studying the text, in dry text in the colo for four hours a day, and suddenly I could actually touch along and see along and see what the post can discuss. It was a very exciting moment. The only issue was that these Chilean calves we got that, were gesund, and me and my small arms, I couldn't get to the bottom of the lawn. So that was the only issue I had. But yes, I did roll up my sleeve. The shechita in Chile was unique, because they only gave us the schlachthaus from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. 
So every few weeks, if I wanted to go, there goes the night. You get home at 3 a.m. and you, you know, you're there, you get the shower afterwards. You get out. <laughs> and that was the that was the shit. We had a lot of good stories. The show that's you know one of those nights driving back. He said that in the past they had better stories. That you know during the Pinochet years, once the army stopped them and said you can't drive in the middle of the night, you must be rebel. You know they had some stories. Then one time one of the oxes got away and ran into the street and you know they got it Spain or something but any event they had a lot of mice on. So what's stage number two? Stage number two is studying the laws of kosher and trefos in detail and I study it and I realize that there could be an halachic problem with any adhesion. I'm studying in the base medrash for years for two years to commit myself to fulfill the moment of inspiration. So that's the study of Torah or stage number Two in my development. Stage number three. You know what stage number three is? I become an, I become a rabbi. I became a rabbi, and it's erev yom tif. It's erev yom tif, and they shaft an animal, and there's a shaila. And if I would go ahead and just live with the ideals that I studied in the base medrash, you know what I would tell my community? If I come with a base medrash philosophy, to erev yom tif, sorry, it's all treif, right? Forget about eating any meat. In the shtetl, you would not eat meat. Why? Because a very high percentage of animals you shet are going to have questions. And if you want to go ahead and take ideals, and the ideal is that if there's any question, I avoid it. I adapt every chumrah in the book, as I did in the Beis Medrash, and you could in the Beis Medrash. But in the, mar in the world, in the real world, it doesn't work like that. You have to have the ability to assess that, you know what, you have to be lenient. They wouldn't eat meat there, correct? We mentioned the fact that in North America, a very high percentage of animals have questions. You know, we have leniencies. Ashkenazi Jewry has a whole list of leniencies to allow people to eat meat. And that's stage number three, step number three. Stage number three is to go ahead and recognize the fact that law must be applied. You can't just live with the ideal. You have to go ahead and apply it. You have to apply it and come up with kulot, with leniencies. That's how it works, right? To go ahead and be, a, you know, it's very, very easy to say everything's us or a four-year-old could do it. But to go ahead and say that things are permissible, you need like a Gedalia Felder who had the ability to go ahead and say, you know what? That is permissible. You don't have to worry about that. You could go ahead and read the ingredients. I still have my memories of childhood of Toronto. Is that we, we were in, I went to a camp. It was a camp that related around food factories. I don't know how exactly it was that every day we would go to this camp. It wasn't a Jewish camp. We had a few Jewish friends there. And we would visit uh, food plants to teach us about food. And unfortunately, as you can imagine, uh, several of the visits were not to kosher food plants. One time we went to this facility uh, where I, I, it wasn't uh, under hashgacha, but they gave us this gigantic box of these chocolate wafers that looked amazing. And I was very excited, because, but I didn't know what would be the status of the verdict. I come home, I was eight or nine years old, and I turned to my father, this is in Mexico, and I say, Dad, what's the status? So he looks at the ingredients, and one of the ingredients, unfortunately, I don't remember which one, he says, there's a Shiloh with that, but I'm going to be visiting, we're going to be in Toronto, uh, visiting, I'll ask Rabbi Felder, right? And I still remember him coming back, and he, I was, we were there at the time, and my father said, Rabbi Felder said it's fine, and I fell in love with Rabbi Felder that moment <laughs> because I knew that this is a man that's great. If I can, and those wafers were very, very good, and I knew that we're dealing with a great man. We're dealing with a man that understands there are realities. You have to go ahead and adjust. You can't walk in just with ideals. You know, Avram Yitzchak Yaakov, Avram Avinu, he was inspired. Something happened. Midrashim indicate that he sensed on his own, you know what, there's a God. He was inspired to change the world. Yitzchak becomes the ideal patriarch, never left the land of Israel, only married one woman, the ideal situation for him. Ola Tmima, they call him, a person that never left the really, in essence, his home due to his blindness, but he meditated in spirituality. He lived in the perfect world. He lived in the Beis Medrash, in the Ohel Moed. Could ya did Yaakov merit such a life? Not at all. Boy, did he have to learn the marketplace. And though, boy, did he learn shtick, right? He learned it because he is the patriarch that represents the real Jew. The real Jew is sometimes, I'm not saying you have to marry four wives, but what you do have to do is deal with the chutzlaretz. You have to go out there. You have to deal with difficulties. You're, not, you're no longer, he settled, purchased land. 
He dealt with, and in those days, he, re, he always had, well, for eternity, represents this idea dealing with the real world. Now, we, let's return to the three stages of our Kabbalah Satorah. Number one, what was the first one? The revelation at Sinai. We were inspired, right? We didn't, we didn't get everything then, but we were inspired. We saw something. Uh, we had clarity. We had an understanding about our destiny. Standing there, and this is what we're celebrating on Shavuos, it's not all the knowledge of Torah, it's the commitment we have. When a person, by the way, converts to Judaism, there is absolutely no requirement that they know so much. But some but they didn't you know, make these requirements that they have. They don't know, if, in essence, a person converting needs to know nothing. What they do have to have is complete commitment. Commitment based on an inspiration. And that's what we had at Harsinai. We went through this conversion, and we were committed to our, relate to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We had clarity, complete clarity. Then, we go through the years in the wilderness. Did we have to deal with uh, stores? Did we have to go to TJ Maxx, the marshals? Did we have to go ahead and figure out if garments have shotness or not? Did we have to interact with society to buy food? Zero. Why? We lived as spiritual entities. Everything was taken care of. It was the years of the Beis Medrash, of the Oel Moed, of the Mishkan. We were in that spiritual state, and that was the second revelation of Torah. <coughs> the second teaching of Torah is a teaching of Torah that takes place in this ideal world. You don't have to go ahead and make any adjustments. You could adapt every single stringency. It doesn't affect anyone because you're in that perfect world. That is stage number two. But then what happens? We move on to a place called Arvot Moab, the east bank of the Jordan River. We start interacting with society, correct? We deal with them. And once we deal with people, once we deal with settling the land, once we deal with people that want to settle here, not go to Eretz Israel, there are many, many questions that they had to deal with that deals with the real world. Welcome to the real world. So yes, you learned those ideals, but now you are in the real world and you have to develop the ability, you have to have the scholarship to come up with leniencies. There are times to find loopholes in the system to allow the system to survive. Without loopholes, the system does not survive. Without a rabbinic tradition that allows what's known as a prusbul or a heter iska or mechiras chometz, we need those loopholes. Without the loopholes, forget about the system surviving. What and when did that, at least symbolically, come into play in our Jewish entity or in our Jewish identity? At Arvot Moav, when they were semi-settled. Okay? Three stages of Torah. Now, I think we agree with it, and, well, but at times there are challenges. How do you know, how do you know which... Am I now in the ideal or not in the ideal? In other words, in our, in our lives, right? Uh, we have situations of, you know, we have all kind of questions that we deal with. You know, kashrut. Uh, you know, we've got to go ahead and, uh, you know, a person's traveling. A person is traveling. They have a halakhic uh, question that they need to be in, uh, in uh, China uh, on a Sunday. And they want to go ahead and leave San Francisco on a Friday afternoon and fly to China and arrive there on uh, Sunday, which they spend Shabbos in the air. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's problematic halakhically, we can imagine. But on the other hand, so you, you could at the same time come up with leniencies. You know, people were on boats. People were on boats for Shabbos, right? You were on a boat on, on, a, on more than one Shabbos. So there's nothing, if you could do it on a boat, why not on a plane? But on the other hand, we all understand that it's not exactly ideal traveling such a distance. So what do you do? Am I in the ideal world or am I in the real world? In other words, if it's a situation, for example, that you're visiting someone and it's a significant uh, issue of health, whatever it is, we all agree that you, know, you should come up with a leniency. If it is just for comfort, because it happens to be you got a better deal and you get double miles if you fly over a weekend, we all agree that not. So how do you assess these things? How do I assess if I am in an OL moed where I only follow the ideals, and how do I assess if I am dealing in the world and I have to come up with adjustments? So we have to remember that we can have clarity by meditating and thinking about the moment of our inspiration, the Har Sinai. Har Sinai, the revelation. Har Sinai, the holiday of Shavuos, 
is a moment that we are inspired to relate to God. Not just to Torah, but to God. Relate to Him. Through Torah, we relate to Him. And if God is our priority, we understand that we can get balanced through it. You can imagine a scale, right? You have, to, you have the middle point. God is the Rabbanu Shalom. Shavuos is right there in the middle. It gives us clarity. And it gives us an understanding in what situations we have to find the leniency, and in what situations God, God forbid to look at leniencies. What gives us that clarity? Har Sinai. And Shemitah is that law, the, the issues, heter mechira, no heter mechira. It's a very significant discussion, because Shemitah, on the one hand, the Torah warns us, if you don't keep it, you're going to be exiled from the land. And on the other hand, if they kept Shemitah in 1896, you know what would have happened? The whole Yishuv would have collapsed. So it's a very delicate situation here. Yishuv collapsing if I keep the mitzvah, being threatened by the Creator that if you don't observe this mitzvah, you won't have a future here. That's a difficult situation. How do I have clarity? How do I know? Is this an Arvos Moab situation? Or is this a situation of Ohel Moab? You have to think Harsinai. It's about God. And we have clarity through that moment of Harsinai. We have clarity that we have to see a big picture. Sometimes the legalities blur us. Sometimes sitting there in the study hall doesn't give us the complete picture. Har Sinai. And that's why Vaidaber, Hashem El Moshe, Har Sinai regarding Shemitah, always remember Har Sinai to have clarity. You know, rabbinic authorities in the past, the way it worked in their contracts were that they would, were able to, the community would commit to support five, ten young students among uh, the community, that he would study with them. In other words, how did you have yeshivas in, uh, in, in, in small communities, in Pressburg even, for example? How did they have yeshivot in such communities? What, what, who supported the yeshivot? So locals would support local kids. Who would be leading the yeshiva? The local rabbi. So when the local rabbi would go ahead and teach these students, as some sofer learned in, as a young man, as he had students in his school, these were basically people that were supported by the local community, and they were able to study and observe the local rabbi. Now what were they observing? They weren't observing the ideal world where everything, you could be strict with everything, because they observed the local rabbi dealing with a, a person who was extremely poor, and they realized how the rabbi for the poor person spent hours trying to find leniency to consider the pot to be the pot to be kosher. And they see that when the rabbi was dealing with the exact same question for someone who was wealthy, he told him, you know what, just throw away the earthenware pot. So the students realize that there's more than just a book. You don't just learn from books. You learn by looking at people. And you have to be sensitive to their needs. And there's a level of flexibility that not could be used, must be used. So in the traditional yeshiva environment that existed, it was a yeshiva together with the local rabbi who were often great gedolei Yisrael. So the students did not live in this ideal world. They were not living in just a world that only had the intellectual development of their own. What did they have? The practical Judaism. They learned the concept of the balance. They learned the idea of a balance. Things, of course, changed with the establishment of the Volozhin Yeshiva, even though the Volozhin Yeshiva itself did have, as its Rosh Yeshiva, a, a rabbi. But as things progressed, especially into the 20th century, there's a very fascinating thing that's taking place in the world, that you have suddenly two schools. You have rabbis and you have Rosh Yeshivas. And unfortunately, they don't often see eye to eye, because the Rosh Yeshiva is living in the Ohel Moed, and you only follow the ideal, and you demand the highest standards for everything, and of course it's impossible for everybody to follow, but they don't understand the concept at times that for the world out there they cannot stick to those high standards. You have rabbis on the other hand who do see that need, and are people that live in the Arvo Smoav. Unfortunately at times it could be the Arvo Smoav person would benefit from a little bit of visiting the Ohel Moed as well for the right balance. But we don't have that balance because we don't have the unity that's necessary. There's a division that takes place. And you see sometimes in communities, we'll mention names, that you have groups of people that call, follow one standard, which is fine as long as they understand, as long as they respect the idea that there are others that cannot stick to those standards. You go ahead and you put for your kosher's agency extremely high standards, you know what the result is going to be? 
that caterers will say we can't accept them. And if caterers can't accept them, people are not going to eat kosher. You have to know that sometimes when you bring the Ohel Moa to the Arvos Moa, you are causing a lot of harm. We need to have the balance, we have to have perspective, and it all comes from Har Sinai. We had a revelation there, but we felt unity. Remember that. They stood there, the Har Sinai, Keishachad, the Levachad. They felt unity. People stood, studied. They studied the highest standards and they were inspired to be great Jews, but at the same time they saw every other Jew and they accepted, accepted them. And they were able to deal with the other Jew. And they were able to value a different philosophy. The ability to go ahead and learn and be inspired to live that perfect life, but yet value and appreciate and understand very well that there are other Jews, that balance is what Har Sinai provided. That's what Shavuos is all about. And that's why the weeks leading to Shavuos, we focus so much not on uh, study of Torah, which is of course important. The focus is, is on Jewish unity. We mourn the passing of these great scholars, the disciples of Rabbi Akiva, but what was lacking? Respect. Without respect, we cannot achieve Har Sinai. And that's what we have to do. And this is what this is the Parsha is all about. And that's what this portion is telling us. Har Sinai is there to teach us the balance between Arvos Moab, this ideal world that exists, and the or Arvos Moab, the practical world that exists, and the Ohel Mohed, the ideal. It's a very important message indeed uh, that hopefully we could all study and benefit from. Thank you for listening. And everyone have a great day.